Technique 17, Ratio. So a physicist sees a young man about to jump off the Empire State Building. He yells, don't do it. You have so much potential. One of our most important goals as teachers is to cause students to do as much of the cognitive work, the writing, the thinking, the analyzing, the talking, as possible. The proportion of the cognitive work students do in your classroom is known as your ratio. As you begin to embrace the technique of ratio, you'll find yourself rarely completing a problem at the board without input of your students. They'll help you identify the next step, reinforce key terms, and finally even check the work that's been done. Your goal is to give students the most practice possible, to apply what they know as much as they can, to do all the work in solving sample problems as opposed to watching you solve sample problems. As you begin to master ratio, you'll realize that you're doing a lot less work and the students are doing a lot more. You will become progressively irrelevant. Now there are times in your class where students are participating actively, almost intensely, but they're not really engaged in the deepest levels of thinking. This is the difference between the participation ratio and the thinking ratio. Let's break these down a little further. The participation ratio describes how much of the participating, right, the answering, the talking, the writing, that students actually do themselves. The thinking ratio gets more at the depth of the increased amounts of participating students do. Is this really passive learning or active engagement? A successful lesson is rarely marked by a teacher getting a good intellectual workout at the front of the classroom. A successful lesson pushes more and more of the cognitive work out to the students as soon as they are ready, with the understanding that the cognitive work must be on task, focused, and productive. As with any technique, it would be impossible to categorize all of the methods that one might follow. However, there are 10 that I think could be really useful at upping your ratio. Number one is unbundle. This is breaking questions into smaller parts to share the work out to more students and to force them to react to one another. Instead of saying, who can tell me the four types of nouns? You might want to try a sequence like, how many types of nouns are there? Uh, Minjay, tell me the first type of noun that we've discussed. Uh, give me an example of that type of noun. You could break the questions down into smaller and smaller pieces and involve a number of different students. Number two, the half statement. Rather than speaking in complete ideas, Express half of an idea and ask a student to finish it. For example, you could say, so the next step is to combine sentences with a... Please tell me, Jamin. Number three, what's next? The fastest way to double the number of questions students get to answer is to ask about process as often as product. That means addressing both how to solve the step write the answer to the step in the problem, and what step comes next. And incidentally, the hardest what's next question is the one for the first step in any solution. Asking, okay, what do I do first? Number four, feign ignorance. Right? You might want to turn the tables on your students and pretend you don't know. Make the student play teacher and narrate what you might otherwise explain. Hmm, so now can I just add an S and make this a third person verb? Number five, repeated examples. This is one of my personal favorites because it allows you to recycle questions that have already been asked and answered. And for some students, that reinforcement of the initial question is all they need to be able to actively participate. Number six, rephrase or add on. Second drafts are better than first drafts because some of the most rigorous thinking goes into making ideas more precise, specific, and rich. You should try and replicate this in your classroom by asking a student to rephrase and improve an answer that was just given. 
This again allows information to be recycled and built upon. Number seven, whys and hows. These questions are dreaded by students, and for good reason. Asking why or how instantly pushes more and more rigorous work onto students, forcing them to explain the thinking that solved the problem. Number eight, supporting evidence. This will really help your students become better critical thinkers because there's far more cognitive work to be done in supporting an opinion than in simply holding one, in testing its logic than in arguing for it. Right? The process of stating an argument and supporting it involves extensive cognitive wrestling that can push your ratio higher. You should be asking your students constantly to explain how the evidence supports them or even give them a position or a variety of opinions and ask them to assemble evidence in support. Number nine, batch process. Batch processing is a method that allows topics to get discussed in smaller groups rather than singly. You know, one student talking to the entire class. You can use an analogy of volleyball where a small group of students are allowed to bounce the ball in the discussion from one end to the other. However, the teacher is part of the team, sort of like a setter, who's able to have control over the direction, the pace, and the focus of the discussion in order to maximize productivity. Number 10, discussion objectives. Open-ended questioning and broad discussion can seem like the ratio Rosetta Stone, uh, but there are a lot of ways in which this can become non-productive. However, teachers who successfully do this start out with a clear objective in mind for any open-ended discussion and use hints to steer their students back on task and especially head off distractions and unproductive topics. Something to keep in mind before you start using this technique is that increased doses of cognitive work should come as soon as students are ready, but not before. Releasing students to solve a problem that requires a skill they hadn't learned or mastered yet in the hopes that they might infer that skill by trying would result in students doing a lot of thinking but not a lot of productive thinking. As always, if you like the video, you can find this one and many others on my Facebook page, Kaizen Teaching. Have a great day!